What's up, peers, and welcome to the World Crypto Network, here with a reading of the Ethics of Money Production, written by Jörg Gita Holtzmann and published by the Mises Institute. Thank you very much for both of them for providing this amazing work, and thank you for watching. Introduction, part one. Money production and justice. The production of goods and services is not a purely technological matter. It always relies on legal and moral frameworks uh, and feedback for, on this framework. A firm and an industry can pursue its activities in a way that conforms and nourishes the basic legal and moral presuppositions of human cooperation. Yet, it can also intentionally or unintentionally contradict and destroy these foundations. Ethical problems of production have been assessed in a great number of industries and ranging from agriculture uh, to textile manufacturing in developing countries to pharmaceuticals. Uh, today, only a few important industries have escaped such scrutiny. The most important of these is the production of money. Money is omnipresent in modern life, yet the production of money does not seem to warrant any moral assessment. To be sure, central banks, respectively, are lecturing the public on the importance of basic business ethics, but their concern do not seem to apply to themselves. Similarly, the subject of business ethics is in a boom phase and on campuses, but it is applied mainly to industrial corporations, and the churches and other religious institutions pronounce on many matter of politics. But monetary phenomena, such as paper money, uh, central banks, de-dollarization, currency boards, and so on, are hardly mentioned at all. For example, Catholic social teaching only vaguely says that economic activity presupposes a stable currency, and that the stability of the purchasing power of money is a major consideration in the orderly development of the entire economic system. There are very detailed statements of Christian doctrine when it comes to the morals of ac uh, acquiring and using money. For example, the Christian literature uh, on usury and on the ethics of seeking money for money's sake is legendary. But important though these problems may be, they are only remotely connected to the moral and cultural aspects of the production of money and especially to the modern conditions under which this production takes place. Here we face a wide gap. Things are not much better if we turn to the discipline that is supposed to be most concerned about money production, namely economic science. There are innumerable economic writings on money and banking, but the number of works that are truly helpful in understanding the moral and spiritual issue of monetary money production is rather small. The more recent literature in this field has tended to be especially myopic in regards to our concerns. Monetary economics deals with discount and open market policies and with the typical goal of policymakers, such as price stability, economic growth, and full employment, and so on. But it does not usually offer any wider, wider historical, theoretical, and institutional perspective. For example, few textbooks actually address the workings of the gold standard, yet a basic acquisition with this institution is necessary to understand the pre precedent state of monetary affairs in the Western world, as well as our political options. The same textbook also turn, tend to suffer from an overly narrow conception of economic analysis, focusing on the realm between a few macroeconomic aggregates, such as the money supply, the price level, and national production. This focus might have a certain pedagogical if justification, but it is nevertheless much too restrictive uh, to do justice to our subject. The production of money has an enormous impact on the relations between human persons and groups, such as families and private associations. The rules of money production determine, the, to a large extent, the transformation of monetary systems throughout time. All of this is important from a moral and spiritual point of view. Yet, it simply vanishes from our intellectual radar screen if we look on money and banking only through macroeconomic spectacles. Finally, few works actually make the step to, of integrating economic and moral categories. The great bulk of the literature either offers no moral assessment of monetary institutions at all, 
or it sets out on moral criticism of exciting institutions without a thorough grasp of economics. Unfortunately, the latter shortcoming is particularly widespread, even among concerned and well-intentioned theologians and teachers of business ethics. Let us empathize that this gap concerns most notably the moral aspects of modern monetary institutions, in particular banks, central banks, and paper money. The Bible provides uh, rather clear-cut moral guides in regards to the production of money in ancient times, in particular with regards to gold and silver coin making. Similarly, the medieval scholastics had developed a very thorough moral doctrine dealing with the old ways of making money. The first scientific treatise on money, Nicholas Oresme's Treatise on the Alteration of Money, made important breakthroughs and is filed with insights, filled with insights, that are still relevant in our days. Prior to his writings, the teaching on the teaching office of the Catholic Church has addressed these problems, most notably Pope Innocent III, Quanto, in 1199, which denounced debasement of coins made out of precious metals. But then the gap appears as soon as we turn to modern conditions. The old precepts about coin making do not exhaust the problems we confront in the age of paper money. And perhaps we encounter here the main reason why contemporary problems popes did not follow up their medieval pre predecessors with any statement addressing the monetary institutions of our age. In our book, we uh, purport to show how high the price of the gap is. Our, exposion, our exposition will be arranged around the economics of money production. Adam Smith and many of his followers have called economics a moral science, and rightly so. Economics not only deals with moral beings, human persons, but it also addresses a great number of questions that have direct moral relevance. In the present case, this concerns most notably the question of whether any social benefit can be derived from the political manipulation of the money supply, or the question how, of how inflation affects the moral and spiritual disposition of the population. The economics of money production will lead us quite naturally to considerations of a juridical, moral, historical, and political nature. Our goal is not to be exhaustive, but to paint a broad picture in sufficient detail. Accordingly, we will first deal with what we will call the natural production of money, that is part one, and discuss the ways in it can be improved in light of moral considerations. Then we will turn into inflation, the pervasion of natural money production, part two. And here we will place great emphasis on the difference between two types of inflation. On the one hand, there is private inflation, which springs up spontaneously in any human society, but which is combated by the power of the state. On the other hand, there is fiat inflation, which, as its name says actually, enjoys the protection of the state and is therefore an institutionalized perversion of money production. In the final part, part three, we will then apply the distinction in a brief analysis of the monetary system of the West since the 17th century. We will argue that natural money production can work as it has worked wherever it has been tried and that there are no tenable technical, economical, legal, moral, or spiritual reasons to suppress its operation. By contrast, there are a great number of considerations that prove conclusively the harmful and evil character of inflation. And in our time, inflation has become persistent and abbreviated because various legal provisions actually protect the monetary institutions that produce this inflation. Money production is therefore a problem of justice in a double sense. On the one hand, the modern institution of money production depends on the prevailing legal order and thus fall within one of the innermost provinces of that innermost provinces of what has been called social justice. The concept of social justice has been devoted by Luigi Taperelli de Azzegui. I'm not going to read that. <laughs>
the public institutions themselves of people ought to make a human society conform to the needs of the common good, that is, to the norm of social justice. If this is done, that most important division of social life, namely economic activity, cannot fail likewise to return to right and sound order. And the man who wrote the first draft of this encyclopedia and cyclical emphasized that social justice was supposed to have an impact on economic institutions with the legal framework. Quote, it shall bring up about the legal society, legal social order that will result in the proper economic order. That is Oswald von Nell Bruyning in Recognition of Social Economy. On the other hand, the prevailing legal order is itself a very pr a problem that causes perennial inflation. Legal monopolies, legal tender laws, and the legalized suspension of payments have unwittingly become instruments of social injustice. They breed inflation, irresponsibility, and an illicit distribution of income, usually from the poor to the rich. These legal institutions cannot be justified and should be abolished at once. Such abolition is likely to entail the elimination of the predominant monetary institutions of our age, central banks, paper money, and fractional reserve banking. Fractional reserve banks do not keep all the money that their customers deposit with them, but they lend a part of the deposits to other people. In most textbooks, this is called bank money creation. The customer's bank account is therefore only partially, fractionally, backed by the corresponding money under direct control of the bank. Below, we will deal with this type of business in more detail. Yet, far from seeing herein merely an act of destruction, such an event can be greeted as a restoration of monetary sanity and as a necessary a condition for a more humane economy. It is true that these are rather radical conclusions. However, one must not shy away from taking a strong stance in the face of great evil. And great evil is precisely what we conformed in the present case. Our goal is not to press a partisan program, however. We seek merely to acquaint the reader with the essential facts needed for a moral evaluation of monetary institutions. A good number of authors who have analyzed the modern problems of money production from a Christian point of view have arrived at a very similar conclusion and did not hold back these views out of any misconceived notion of temperance. Uh, Francis Dennis Fahey uh, started his book quoting from a letter of apostolic delegate in Great Britain. The letter was, was from a pen of a group of mainly Catholic businessmen and scholars. The author stated that they had studied of the fundamental cause of the present world unrest and have long been forced to the conclusion that an essential first step is the immediate resumption of the community in each nation of its prerogative over the issue of money, including its modern credit substitute. And Frau uh, Anthony Hulme concluded his ex exquisite study quite along the same lines. The work was written to show that there is a problem, to show that the problem is chiefly one of the creation of interest-bearing debt which permitted to be used as basis for money, to show the way in which this is permitted by the rights to the return of monetary lent. And now part two, remarks about relevant literature. The argument for natural money production and against inflation goes back many centuries to the 14th century French bishop Nicolas Oresme. On Oresme, see in particular Emily Perdre. Before him, St. Thomas Aquinas and others have considered various aspects of the problem, but none of them had tackled it from a consistent point of view, and none of them had presented their ideas in a treatise. There were the beginnings of a doctrine, but this doctrine was scattered throughout the writings of Aquinas, Buridan, and others. 
A very thorough study of Aquinas's monetary thought and its sources of inspiration is in Fabian Rittig's Geld als Instrument der Gerechtigkeit, uh, that is translated from German money as instrument of uh, justice. More generally, on the School of Paris, uh, see Odd Langton, Economics in the Medieval Schools, Wealth, Exchange, Value, Money, Usury, accor according, according to the Paris theological tradition. Okay, Orasmus' great achievement was to integrate the, these previous works as well as his own penetrating insights into a treatise, the first treatise on money ever. The great historian of medieval economics, the thought Victor Prandt, pointed out that there is certainly merit in assembling such a work. And Brandt observed very justly that Oresme was unsurpassed for centuries. He expressed, and I quote, ideas that were very much on the point, m more on the point than those that would dominate long after him. In hindsight, we can certainly say that Oresme's treatise has stood the test of time. Translations into English, German, and French are still in print. And, moner and monetary economics all over the world admire the work for its concise, conciseness, clarity, and depth. Later, on the case of natural money production and against inflation, was taken up and refined in various directions through the writings of the Proto-Currency School, branch of the School of Salamanca. Uh, that is... Oh, so. Spanish here in 14, see Huerto de Soto, the new light of the prehistory theory of banking and the school of Salamanca. Modern translations of these writings are not readily available. However, thanks to the Acton Institute, two works of the schools of Salamanca have recently been translated and published into English. That is Juan de Marinas, a treatise on the alteration of money, and Martin de Aztipecla, commentary on the resolution of money. Since we cannot go into detail, let us merely remark that both works lack the lu lucidity and penetration that can be found in Oresme's treaties. Moreover, Atspilqueta's work does not really deal with money, but with exchange in general, and in particular with the concept of just price. It considers monetary problems, such as the distinction between monetary and non-monetary use of coins only to the extent that, the, that they affect their competition, their concept. To the present author, it is a mystery why the original title, Commentary Resolutio de Cambios, has been re rendered as Commentary on the Resolution of Money. A literal translation would be Commentary Settling Problems of the Theory of Exchange. Yet none of these authors seem to have produced a treatise that could match Oresme's earlier work. Another two centuries later, however, economists such as Richard Cantillon, David Hume, Etienne de Codillac, huh? John Wheatley, David Ricardo, and William Gotch publish noteworthy contributions on problems of monetary production. These writings had more or less dropped the scholastics uh, concept concern for the spiritual dimension of the question, but they pioneered a realistic economic analysis of fractional reserve banking and paper money. Some of these writings are still in print today and have thus stood the test of time. While we do not dis disparage their merit and their brilliance in noting that they too, in the new field of banking and paper money, could not quite match the achievement of the old master Oresme in the field of commodity money. In our age, the author, the authors who have contributed most to the analysis of our problem were the two agnostic Jews, Ludwig van Mises and Murray Newton Rothbard, who in turn were followers of, the f followers of the founder of the Austrian School of Economics, Karl Menger. See Karl Menger, the Grundsätze der Volkswirtschaftslehre, or the basics of economics. Okay, here are just a bunch of different resources uh, that are very worth uh, checking out. I will not read all of them. Mises integrated the theory of money and banking within the overall theory of subjective value and pioneered a macroeconomic analysis in the realist tradition. In Rothbard's work, then, the Austrian theory of money found its present apex. Rothbard not only developed 
and refined the doctrine of his teacher, Mises. He also brought ethical concerns back into the picture, stressing natural law categories of cr criticized fractional reserve banking and paper money. Our work is squarely built on the work of these two writers. Importantly, living authors in this tradition are Pascal Salin, George Reismann, and Jesus Huerta de Soto. See in particular all these books that are listed right here. The affinity between the Austrian school economics and the scholastic tradition is fairly well known among experts. It is indeed more than a mere affiliation. Rothbard and Huerta de Soto have explored the historical roots of Austrian economics in the economic, economic writings of the late scholastic school of Salamanca. See Murray Rothbard, New Light of the Prehistory of the Austrian School. And Jesus de Suerta, New Light of the Prehistory of the Theory of Banking and the School of Salamanca. Mm -hmm. okay. the, the modern Austrian school distinguishes itself by the quest for realism that pervades both its arguments and the problems it deals with, much more than any other present day pra paradigm in economic science. Its cognitive approach and its practical conclusion are in harmony with the scholastic tradition. One historian of economic thought characterized the scholastic approach to the analysis of economic phenomena in the following words. They did not examine an economic problem as an autonomous phenomenon consisting of measurable variables, but only as an adjunct of the social and spiritual order. In, and in the context of cura a animarum, the care of souls. Uh, this is Julian Kirchner's Raymond de Rivaux on scholastic economic thought. And I quote, the great difference between scholastic and contemporary economics is one of scope and methodology. The doctors approached economics from a legal point of view. They attached excessive importance to formalism so that the study of economics nearly reduced itself to an investigation into the form and nature of contracts. At the end of the present work, the reader will be in a better position to judge the extent to which this approach is excessive or justifiable in the light of useful results. Austrians share the scholastic belief that there is no such thing as an economic science dealing with autonomous variables. Economic problems are aspects of larger social phenomena. And it is most expedient to deal with them as such, rather than to analyze them in some twisted separations. In a, the, in a brilliant essay, the Lutheran theologist William Cash has argued that a, the present day separation of monetary theory and the theology has harmed both disciplines. It was driven th theology towards a gno gnostic denial of the world. And it has turned monetary theory into a narrow auxiliary discipline of central bank policy. Cash points out that monetary theory, precisely because of its narrowly conceived, is in the process of misunderstanding its subject matter on losing any scientific foundation, turning itself into a barren intellectual game. And see his book on Geld und Glaube, and that is Money and Belief. Not surprisingly, Austrian economics has inspired a few viable modern contributions to the moral analysis of money production. Apart from Rothbard's work, we need to mention in particular Bernard Dempsey's Interest and Usury from the pen and of a trained Thomist philosopher and economist. This book is a path-breaking contribution to the modern moral analysis of fractional reserve banking and thus covers some of the grounds of our present study. Dempsey has shown that economic analysis can be successfully blended within the scholastic philosophical tradition into something like the natural theology, theology of money and banking. The reason is that there is no irreconcilable conflict of basic principle. Both parties proceed from trust, from truths known from natural reason alone. Dempsey, uh, in his book Interest and Usury, Two decades later, Friedrich Beuter undertook a, syst a systematic moral assessment of inflation in our time and came to the conclusion very much akin to those of Nicolas Oresme. He argued that inflation in principle is morally evil and that it could be licit to overcome. 
Epochal Conflicts and Crises. That is in his book, Zur sittlichen Beurteilung von Inflationen. And that is to the, to the proper judgment of inflation. I'm not sure about this translation. In our day, Thomas Woods has brilliantly argued that Austrian economics, on the one hand, and Christian morals, Catholic, Catholic, Catholicism in particular, on the other hand, are fully compatible. In the church and the market, he gives a concise statement of the Austrian analysis of the labor market, of money and banking, of foreign aid, and of the welfare state. And he shows that this analysis provides crucial information for an adequate moral assessment of the market economy and of government interventionism. Unfortunately, these works have been rather exceptional. During most of the past 150 years, Christian writers and Catholic intellectuals in particular have been quarreling with the economic institutions of the modern world. And this huge uneasy relationship had ample foundations in fact, as we will see in more detail. But whereas they, these thinkers refused to make peace with the secular world, they faithfully made their peace with pro-inflation doctrines that became fashionable again during the Great Depression. And this in turn vitiates, vitiated the moral assessment of the modern monetary institution. A good case in point is Anthony Holmes' book Morals and Money, truly excellent in its exposition of what the Bible and Christian moral traditions have to say about money. It is also endorsed Orse's age-old mercantilist fallacies about the workings of money within the economy. Hume believed that the money supply had to grow along with output and that, that the slowing down of aggregate spending is disadvantageous, as is as it hoarding, deflation, and the diver diversion of spending streams into financial markets. This leads him straight to the conclusion that our currency needs to be managed. He develops, he deplores the inflation produced by fractional reserve banking, but not because of its inflationary, after all he believes that inflation is necessary, but because it benefits private agents. The solution to present-day monetary uh, calamities is not to abolish the institution of inflation, root and branch, but to hand the inflation to machines over to elected politicians. The same characteristic set of ideas accepted of the basic case for inflation, therefore only rejection of private fractional reserve banking while endorsing of public fiat back paper, fiat paper money can be identified in all major Catholic authors until the early post-war period. In short, misconceptions about the economic role of the money supply have vitalized the efforts of scholars to develop a cogent moral assessment of modern monetary institutions. We will therefore discuss the crucial question whether there are any social benefits to be derived from the manipulation of the natural production of money in a separate chapter of the present work. Another group of noteworthy studies integrating moral concerns in Austrian economics come from the pen of evangelistic, evangelical scholars who call themselves the Christian Reconstructionist, in particular Gary North's Honest Money brilliantly combines biblical exposition and economics. Any serious attempt to, comb, uh, to come to grips with money and banking from a moral point of view must take into account the argument presented in North's work. This should, be, should not be taken as an all-out endorsement of North's more general enterprise of developing a Christian economics. The present author does not believe that there is such a discipline as there is no Bolshevistic mathematics or Muslim quantum physics. <laughs> Other authors have argued along similar lines, yet without attaining the level of sophistications displayed in North. Among the better works of his group, as we mentioned, Howard Kernshen's God, Gold, and Government. Money and banking are fascinating subjects that have attracted a panoply of writers who have neither the knowledge nor the intellectual ability to master this field. The quantitative dominance of the poor writings might have contributed to throwing the entire enterprise of integrating ethics and monetary economics into disrepute. 
But there is also another strong mechanism at work that helps account for the death, for, for, for the dearth of uh, scholarships along these lines. Professional, professional and institutional bias. The general thrust of the above mentioned works is to cast serious doubt on the necessity and expediency of the government sponsored production of money through central banks and monetary authorities. The authors argue that money and banking should be the subject to the general stipulations of the civil law. The government should not run the surprise supervised bank and the production of paper money. Its essentially mission is to protect property rights, especially the production, the property of bank customers. Any further involvement produces no harm, more harm than good. Now, it is one of the home truths of the economic profession that virtually all of its members are government employees. Even more to the point, a great number of monetary economists are employed of the central bank and other monetary authorities. And even those monetary economists who are only regular professors at the state universities deserve considerable prestige and sometimes also large chunks of their income from research conducted on behalf of monetary authorities. Economics rely, relish, economists relish in pointing out the importance of economic incentives in the determination of human behavior. While virtually no section of society has escaped their scathing criticism, until very recently, few of them have been concerned about their own incentives. Yet the facts are plain. Championing a government intervention in money and banking pays the bills. Promoting the opposite agenda shuts down the doors to an academic career. No consistent economist could expect monetary economists to lead campaigns against central banking and paper money. See Lawrence H. White, The Federal Reserve System Influence on Research in Monetary Economics. Significantly, the only recent successful campaign for monetary reform that was led by professional economists had to avoid the involvement of experts employed within monetary authorities. When Fritz Machlup and Milton Friedman and others prepared for the reform of the Bretton Woods system in the late 1960s, they studiously excluded any intellectual employed by the aforementioned within the IMF. Institutional backing came from the outside of the monetary establishment, namely from the American Enterprise Institute. The movement eventually rallied in the town of Bürgenstotz in Switzerland. See the eyewitnesses account of the members of the Bögenstock group in Wolfgang's Kasper. He who acquaints himself with the modern scientific literature on money and banking must not close his eyes to these facts. Piers, thank you very much here for listening to The Ethics of Money Production, a phenomenal book by Jörg Guido Hulzmann, published by the Mises Institute. Thank you very much to both of these outstanding, uh, well, to both the Mises Institute and your Guido Hulsman, and to you for listening. Thank you very much, and see you on the next show. Bye-bye.